Oh, very good. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Wonderful. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, um, no problem. I really feel I feel a bit self-conscious because I just watched your fantastic discussion. <laughs> and I imagine you're running to get your cup of coffee for the next one. Yeah, I am. And I've actually got another interview, just so you know, at uh in 30 minutes. So I, yes. I don't have we, so I got about 20 minutes. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And everybody, I want to introduce you to the economic ninja, the one and only. Um, I don't know if you've seen his channel, but go check it out. The Economic Ninja on YouTube. It's fantastic. He has excellent information. I just love what you did yesterday on that seven minute thing with the buy low, sell high, the tractors. Oh, yeah, man. That's honestly, that was amazing. I was I was making literally one hundred thousand dollars a year cash doing that during the recession. <laughs> it was incredible. What a great side hustle. And the thing I love about it is you went with eight thousand dollars. You and your dad went out there. You were polite to the guy. You said, look, I'm going to make you a lowball offer. Is that okay? I'm not really a jerk, but, you know, he says, yeah, come on out. And you you got learning from that. Your learning was you realized the time of year, the guy's attention, and the fact that he was willing to sell because he was distracted, more or less. Yeah, well, I've been doing side hustles since I was in junior high. And what it really took off was I bought my first house. I used uh, electric trains to buy my first house. And so I was always, you know, scouring garage sales, things like that, and, and classified ads. And the holidays were always the greatest time, not only to buy and sell things, but also that's when I always buy my home. That's always buy my cars because um, people are desperate and they don't know why they're desperate. And that's because of insecurity. So it's really a, a, a lesson in psychology, uh, not, you know, buying and selling things. Yeah. Okay. How people do things, right. Human behavior. And yep. so that's just what I want to share with people is that this is just a great example. I mean, there's another gentleman that my, was my dad's friend and this guy was in his late sixties and they were sitting at Harley Davidson every morning drinking coffee and the guy's on his phone doing stuff. And my dad says, what are you doing one day? And he says, Oh, I'm uh, buying and selling cars. And he goes in a car trader, auto trader, you know, these magazines, old school stuff, but he goes over there and he, he goes to the person's house or he calls him on the phone and he makes a low ball offer on the, an insulting offer on all these cars, but he kept on doing that. It was a numbers game. And yeah. he would, he would get, they would just call him back because if the car wasn't selling those call the guy back and say, you're my only offer. And he would get it for like half value. And he wouldn't even take the title. He would just pay him, take it away and he would flip it. And this guy was making like three times his pension fund. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll give away some of my my course on how to do this stuff. So um, I understand the numbers game, but I understood a long time ago the, the importance of being honest because everyone is the insulting type. Everyone wants to insult you on... Uh, you know, your, your product is crap. It's not worth that much. Yeah. The market is cheaper. I could find it cheaper. And I would always go, you should go there. Yeah. Or, or how about like, oh my gosh, where? Like I wouldn't buy it. And it right. would always work out well. And being honest and truthful were always the best yeah. uh, strategies. And I, I mean, if you want, I could tell you about, I just literally sold a car to a dealer yesterday and they tried to talk us down and it was a, a perfect car. It was, we'd had it for two years literally in perfect shape. They get back and they go, well, we can only, you know, we got to take off $800 because the tires are cut. And my wife is there and I can't even stop my wife fast enough because she doesn't understand the game that they've got to get you for something. Right. Sure. And I said, okay. And she goes, no, they're not cupped. And they're trying to explain and they're rubbing the tires and I'm staring, staring at, you know, and a guy and a girl rubbing tires. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is literally just the negotiation. So right. when they're all done talking, I simply just said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, this is the price you wanted. So we're going to go down to the next dealer. And if they don't offer us as much as they are, you get, you've offered us, we'll come back. It sound good? Yeah. And they're like, uh, uh, no, but why not just do it now? And I'm like, well, because it's worth another 800 bucks right now to just drive down the street. I'm not that rich. And um, right. yeah, and they literally just went, fine, let's just do it. You know, because they, they, I'm looking at around in an empty lot. They had nothing to sell. And I'm like, I literally have a perfect car. Are we going to mess around? I'm like, I probably could go get another thousand dollars down the street. Yeah. So yeah, it's just about being honest and upfront. And, and that's what I've learned. I mean, you talk about the flipping things without a title. I was selling part model trailers and we literally were making $150,000, $200,000 a year doing that. We started that business from 900 bucks uh -huh. and we never put the title in our own name. And we would, after a while, right. we, we found being honest and saying, hey, like we're reselling this. And this is what me and my best friend do to save up money for our family's vacation fund. And more yes. people just went, Oh my gosh, I want to sell it to you. Yes. You're the only honest person. You're actually going to go make money off of this. We want to sell it to you. And that yes. really set off the light bulb. That's when I started teaching people about how to flip things. Yes. And if you treat someone with uh, that, you, you act as if the person is intelligent because that people are intelligent and you want to be respected for your intelligence. And if you treat someone with the same level of respect, you're going to get what you want. 
time. There, there's no time. reason to think that you're going to trick somebody. Huge. Yeah. And if you really, really? do keep their uh, best interest at heart, a lot of people would also, yes. um, I, they would call me and say, Hey, you know, you made that offer, that lowball offer. I couldn't sell it. And I would always say things like, I honestly believe your trailer's priced right. It's just not priced right for me. And mm -hmm. I think you should be able to sell it. But if for some reason you can't call me, they call me back a few months later. Sometimes I didn't have the money because I got three or four trailers in inventory. Yeah. And I would say, look, I can't, how would you like me to sell it for you? And you come bring it all write up a little agreement. And then I wouldn't even have to buy the trailer. I would sell it, make a profit and hand them a check and make sure all their documents were in line. And then I got repeat business. So again, honesty. And that's what's really cool right now in a world full of douchebags. I'm sorry, but like, dude, come on. I mean, this world <laughs> is completely there. falling apart. You right. get to shine. So it's so easy to be a hero this yeah. day. And you can over deliver. You can do more than they expected. Just just treat them like you want to be treated. Really, it's, absolutely. It's that simple. Yeah. So so let me ask you. I mean, we we can there's we can talk for days, but we have a similar history, by the way. Oh. I, I'm I'm uh, the oldest of three sons. Nice. Like you are. And I was in when I was in junior high and high school. I always had a stack of one hundred dollar bills on my desk, you know. And and I but I, I always had a side hustle from when I was uh, twelve years old. And I'm not yep. gonna tell you what all that stuff was, but. I used to do other people's homework, by the way, you know, for oh, money. But, okay. We are not alike. <laughs> okay. Well, I, everyone I would, would have things. failed school if I would have done their homework. And I was not a good student. So that just oh, goes sweet. to show you. So you but, are a hustler. Yeah. But, so hey, seize, yeah. get degrees. Let's just make sure that's clear right now, guys. Your yeah, doctor well, didn't get A's. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, another story there, but let me ask you this. So everyone talks about gold is going to do this and silver is going to do that. And it probably will. And it's probably going to be 3000 an ounce next year. Probably. And so all of you that are wanting to, to be 3,000 an ounce, what the heck are you going to do then? Yeah. And do you have the gold? So if you have the gold, assuming you have the gold, yeah. then what? What is yes. it? What do you think? So, you know, one huge misconception that's going on in the gold and silver community is that you will literally use it for transactions. You will barter with it. I'm going to tell you right now, that is absolutely not what you're going to do. Right. Uh, my grandfather was, I came from, my family was wealthy uh, because my great grandfather was very meek. And instead of wearing fancy clothes, even though he was literally a millionaire, uh, uh, right during the great depression, he, you couldn't tell. And what he did is he warned everyone, uh, right before the great depression to stop getting in debt with these, uh, fancy tractors they were selling uh, this automation that was happening. And he said, you need to do it cash. He ended up buying up all of his friends farms and, and putting them to work yeah. because they yeah. lost it all because of the debt. And, uh, my grandfather, my grandfather says that they would kill you if they caught you with gold during the Great Depression. Like, yeah. he's like you don't walk around like, hey, yeah. look at all the money I got. And the facts are, when gold is going up, like in, in Venezuela a few years ago during their hyperinflation, do you think anyone just walked into a store and went, hey, I got a gold coin, I want to buy something? No, they went through an escrow process. They transferred yes. it for value, uh, value for value. Even though the currency was falling in value on that day, if you want to buy a house, and literally during uh, the hyperinflation of Venezuela, you could buy a house in parts of the country for one ounce of gold, you would go, hey, I'm going to buy that. And they go, okay, we want 10 billion uh, whatever. Right. And you're like, okay, cool. Uh, let's start a contract. I'll be back next week with 10 mm -hmm. billion or whatevers. And I'm going to go down to a bank and I'm going to transfer that gold because it's now a fixed rate. It's now fixed. The price is fixed because of a contract in that currency. I'm going to go sell my gold. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the currency and I'm going to go buy it. And people yes. don't understand that. They, and, and what even blows me even more away, there's not enough silver in the world to put an ounce in every single person's right. hand. It's, it's estimated like one tenth of one ounce for every right. human being. So it'll be like coin clipping from the Roman times where it's like, you know, it's going up so, so much in value. It's getting smaller and smaller. It's like, I've got this grain of sand. What do you want to buy with it? It's like, come on. So it's value transfer. And that's where it is. We no longer can be in a precious metal um, uh, physical uh, currency, but we can be in a backed currency mm -hmm. and we will. I don't think the U.S. is going to go that route. I think it'll be Russia and China along with the BRICS nations. But yeah, I think people are very, have a very big misconception when it comes to uh, a value transfer during a new digital currency age. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, they, they see gold as an asset, and maybe it is because they can sell it for more possibly than they paid for it. But really, it's not going to feed you. What are you going to do when it's worth more? Uh, can you sell it and buy something that actually makes money? Yeah, you okay, so it will feed that. you, right? Yeah. The dollar doesn't feed you. Do you eat yeah. it? No, everyone sits there and it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You can't eat gold. Cool. I'll give you $20 if you shove this $1 bill down <laughs> your throat and swallow it, you moron. And I'm not joking. We've got to start calling people dumb because they're dumb. And it's because you're not thinking. You're trying. People are trying to prove you wrong when they have no concept. They can't even prove themselves right. Yeah. Yeah. And so can't put 
gold in my gas tank. Sure. Co- I got this thing, a rod. It's called a ram rod. We're going to give you 20 bucks, shove that dollar right down the pie hole of that fuel tank, and let's see how that thing drives. No, you sell it. It's just like this. People tell me all the time, uh, I can't buy a house of gold. I'm like, cool. I can't buy a house of stocks either. I mean, like, seriously, what are we doing? It's like you have to go and sell something to buy it. There's always a medium of exchange. And throughout this world's history, ever since Jesus was on the earth, it became the fiat standard. It started with a note on a piece of papyrus. And that was the first point in history where the money changers started to transfer the wealth of the world, water, land, uh, natural resources, gold, Mm -hmm. silver, things like that for something printed with an idol literally on it. Yeah. So that has never changed. And it's never going to change. As a matter of fact, in the end of the book, it says what's going to happen with the currency system. So people need to really wake up. All right. And so if people are spending more time talking themselves out of this, then, then yeah, don't, don't buy it. Like, like move on to something else, get a widget. Now, what would you do when the price goes up? Do you have a plan where you would sell some gold and possibly buy something that makes money or that you can buy low and sell high? Would you liquidate at that point? I've already sold silver before. Um, It was funny. Um, I bought silver once at $30. And it was down to 25, 24, something like that. And I sold it. I sold like, I don't think 500 ounces. And uh, I told my wife, because she always said, you'll never sell it. I'm like, hey, I'm selling it today. But it's at a loss. I'm like, well, I'm going to go buy a tractor today. Because a tractor right. was a smoking deal. I took right. that tractor. I flip, And this is the other thing too. The whole uh, at old adage, well, you know, when, when the price is down or the price is high, no one's going to be able to buy it. Or no one's going to want to buy it. I'm like, yeah, watch this. I brought my wife like to the coin store. I want you to come inside. She wouldn't even come inside with me. Hold, grab this box. I'm like, I want you to see how fast this happens. I literally set it down. Guy pulls out hundred dollar bills, hands me a stack of hundreds. I walk out. Well, here you go. And she goes, well, it doesn't matter because you're just going to sell that tractor and buy more silver. And I'm like, yes. So I just gave an example of how I I sold silver when it was down. Now, when it goes up, the reason why I'm using precious metals as a financial weapon right now is because I believe that during a currency devaluation around the world, you are going to see the value of currencies fall, which are going to push gold and silver, platinum, palladium, all kinds of assets like uh, oil, um, natural gas, everything that is from the earth will go up in value. Why? Because inflation is causing the, the purchasing power to go down. Well, at that hap- when that happens, you're also going to see real estate tank. And the reason why is because as asset um, prices and real assets go up, including real estate, interest rates are going to start to skyrocket as well because currencies around the world are falling and governments have to prop them up. The only way a government can prop up a currency is two ways. Pull a certain amount of currency out of circulation or raise the interest rates so that people will buy and hold onto that currency, hoping for a better rate of return. So I know without a shadow of a doubt, there is a cycle that is happening right now. No matter where you see the price of gold and silver at today or tomorrow, that is going to become more valuable than the currency, which means real estate is going to fall. So there will be a day where you take your precious metals and buy real estate, cash flowing real estate, and then the cycle repeats. The problem is you can never hit the top, you can never hit the bottom, and then trying to get that out of people's hands. Well, I don't care. I'm doing it. I'm going to sell it. Um, and then, you know, they can buy up real estate as it starts going up with the headlines. Oh, real estate's recovered. Oh, now's the time. Well, you've lost a certain percentage on your gold and you've now lost, missed out on a certain rate of rise in the real estate. So if you're headline readers and you invest that way, you're always going to lose because headlines are always late. If it's in the news today, you've already missed the boat. And it's, I, I like that point you made that you, you're willing to sell your precious metal. It doesn't didn't matter that it was at the top of the market or if you made money on it. You're selling it to get a thing that's going to make you money. You already knew you're going to make money with it. And then you'll probably go back into silver later. Yeah, it was a calculated risk. And yeah, yeah. I did double my money and I did yeah. buy double the silver. My wife was totally right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That well, one in her book. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you one last question. And I just want you to cover this on pension funds. What do you think about leaving your money in a pension fund? Is that a good plan these days? Okay, so first off, I'm not a financial advisor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And oh, just, you know, I've been wrong uh, literally for eight years. And the reason why I say eight years is because I believe this whole thing was coming down in 2015. But the Federal Reserve did something. They started to raise interest rates from 2015 to 2018 because the dollar was collapsing. Our markets were in very serious turmoil. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's also when they uh, slowed their purchases of QE. Um, Pension funds, I took almost everything out of my uh, retirement Mm -hmm. and I bought precious metals. Now, if you look at the dates that I bought that metal, I'm a loser. I have lost money. But if you look at as it came down, the more uh, excited I got and I bought more dollar cost averaging, I'm well up on a percentage basis. Uh, But a lot of people put timing 
and and these yeah. uh, sort of like nuts and bolts to investing, but they don't realize the intent of the investment and how long term or short term those investments are. Hopefully you can hear me. I got a, a dump yes. truck literally right outside. Um, my point being is that right now pension funds are failing. It, it's evident around the a country and around the world. And the most evident one is like the the quarterly filings of like BlackRock, uh, Blackstone, uh, CalPERS, you know, CalPERS is literally having to liquidate assets to keep up. They need to keep, I believe, 7% year over year uh, uh, increase just to pay current beneficiaries. And the truth is more and more people are uh, retiring than were ever expected because not only do you have the baby boomers that were supposed to start retiring from 2016 on, you had that exacerbate. Uh, it got worse because of COVID. And so people just said, I'm out of here. I ain't dealing with these masks. I ain't dealing with these extra rules. I'm out. And they retired early, which even yeah. put even more added strain on. So I believe that pension funds are in the serious hurt locker. And I have been planning for the last 12 years of my life that my pension is not going to be there. And so thank right. heavens I did because I built my own pension. I put just the minimum in, the, the agency matching, and then I went out on my own to be successful. And the first uh, rule in being successful is getting out of debt because now you're not a slave. You don't have a master and you have a free uh, path in front of you, a clear path. It may be short, narrow, and straight, but the fact is it's your path. And so then you start to build wealth. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good message. Um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you leave this one, one and I'll let you go after this. If you would, please pitch us on the side hustle and why everybody should get involved in that program. Yeah. You know, it sounds funny. Because I'm not a very fancy guy. Uh, there's nothing much to me, but I have these nuts and bolts. And I do have a gift in being able to explain things at a very basic level. And I've done all these different types of side hustles. And the reason why I started that course was not only to bring in finances into my house, right? Mm -hmm. But to be able to share with people all of my lessons learned, the good things I did, but really the things that went wrong. And it sounds funny, but so many people just don't know where to start because when they think about starting a business, they think of a building, they think of trucks and cars and you had to buy all this stuff and you've got debt and all this stuff. And it's literally as easy mm -hmm. as going into your garage. It sounds funny. I started with the basics. Yeah. Go into your right. garage, find those things you don't have. This is how you're right. going to sell it. I'm going to teach you how to actually sell. I'm going to teach you how to list something. I'm gonna, then I'm going to teach you how to take that money that you just made, that 200 bucks. I'm going to show you how to go and buy things the right way. And it sounds funny. And even like, well, how do I pick a business? How do I pick a side hustle? It's literally as easy as what do you like? What's your hobby? Yes. And then, and then how to budget. And I started really simply. And it's blowing my mind how many people have contacted me and said, I literally started a business, a side hustle, a couple of days a week. And I've literally got like, like within a year, they've got literally a $10,000 or $20,000 in their pockets, in their hands that they didn't get from their job because, and I teach people about how to keep it separate. So it's literally, and it sounds funny. The first lesson in the course is the only thing you should be getting from this course is your money back. And then if you learn how to get your money back from maybe one or two nuggets from this entire lesson, then all you have to do is do that again and again and again, and you just make right. money every single time. And once you break it down to that, and it's not a get rich quick mm -hmm. thing, it's just nuts and bolts, simple, logical answers to questions, you just start making money and then you build on those lessons. And that's really, it's not really a good pitch. It's just, that's what it is. Well, that, that is. And, and thank you for that. And I wanted to say to everyone, I don't know Economic Ninja. He was very kind to just immediately say, yeah, I would, I would interview with you. What, and he gave me a time. I have never spoken with him before this call. Uh, we don't have any deals, uh, no arrangements. Um, and I would just, I just like what his offer is. I like what he says. And if you guys want to check it out, if you would just give us the website. Oh, I don't have a website. It's just, it's just okay. a link on all my uh, YouTube yeah, channels. Just go there. My side hustle course, but I'll tell you this, I'll speak right. to what you just said. Um, right. I don't say no to anyone. And the reason actually I do big channels that call me and ask me to come on their channel. I say no, or they are always trying to get on my channel. I say, no, I said, I only go on small channels. And the reason why is because when I started, it was two years ago, I said, I want to be number one in the entire space. And my goal was to become more um, uh, viewed than uh, the mainstream media. And I've already passed CNN's daily views. My goal is Fox News next. And my goal is to be able to share the light and truth um, with people, but also give them hope because we'll give them direction, right? And so the only way I could become successful is if I help other people become successful. And I say, look, I'm only one person, one man. I only got so many hours a day. Why don't I help other people that are that have a voice, that have knowledge? You know, I wasn't good in school. Um, C's get degrees. I, I didn't even get those. And my point is, if I help other people become great, then I will just rise along with them. It's a leadership principle. People need to realize, and that's yeah. there's very few leaders in this world. So we just need to stand up and go. All right, let's help other people. My goal is not to be the coolest kid in the block, but to be honest with you, 
I will become the coolest people in the block if I make everybody around me successful because who doesn't want to be around someone that helped them? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Economic Ninja. Yeah. I appreciate your time so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. I got All another right, interview. I'll jam. See you guys. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.